Welcome to the second video on box plots and quartiles and median. So in this video, we uh, are going to talk about how to interpret box plots. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Okay, so here we have a couple histograms. Remember we talked about histograms in a previous video. Histograms show us a the distribution of a data set. Okay, so um, box plots also show us a distribution. So should we, we should be able to relate the two. Given a histogram, we should be able to get some idea of what a box plot looks like. And given the box plot, we should be able to get some idea of what the histogram looks like. So remember what a box plot does. A box plot splits the data into quarters. A histogram also tells us the amount of data, but it doesn't do it in percentages per se. It just tells us how much data is in a given range. So if we look at this first histogram over here, all right, look at this guy. What we can see is that between uh, 0 and 10, the amount of data is the same as the height of that first bar. Okay. And the amount of data between 10 and 20 is the height of this second bar. And the amount of data between 20 and 30 is the height of this bar. And the amount of data between uh, 30 and 40 is the height of that bar. So by thinking about that, by, by realizing that, we can kind of get an idea of how many bars does it take until we get a quarter of the data? Well, that's where the first quartile is. All right, so that's how we're going to find the first quartile. So let's erase some of this scribblings. And um, let's think about how many of these bars do we have to shade in before we shade it in a quarter of the total area of this histogram. All right, so I certainly would have to, oops, not letting me draw in here. Uh, okay, let's try that again. Okay, hmm. It wants to, thinks I'm trying to do something else. Okay. I, I'd certainly have to shade in this part this much, probably that much. Uh, did I get a quarter of everything yet? Mm, looks like less than a quarter to me. Um, I'd probably need about half of this bar, right, before I got to a quarter of everything. So that's about a quarter of the data right there. So that's where my first quartile would lie. So if I was going to draw a box plot, um, I would put my first quartile about there. Now, where do I, how far do I have to go before I get the second quartile? Let's pick a slightly different color for that stuff. So the next 25% of the data. Okay, so here, mm, stop. <laughs> Let me shade. I would probably need to go up. This is way too big of a thing. Still learning how to use this thing. Uh, was that a, is that the next quarter? Maybe a little bit more. Maybe a little bit into this. Maybe a little bit into this bar here. And that's probably the second quarter of the data. So that gives me my second quartile. Now, how far do I have to go to get my third quartile of data? Probably. Come on, guy. Probably this much, maybe a little bit of this. All right, maybe that. That would give me the third quarter of the data. Oops, oops, no line there. And now I draw the box. That's the middle 50% of my data in there. Now, I have to draw those whiskers out to the min and max. Now, you might think I'll go to 0 and 10, 100, although if you remember how a histogram works, the histogram the height of this bar here is the amount of data in between 0 and 10. Do we know as a fact that any data values are equal to 0? No. We just know that there are a bunch of data values between 0 and 10. We don't know how small the smallest data value is. We just know it's between 0 and 10. So let me just draw the whisker out to in between 0 and 10 because I don't know that I should go all the way to zero. And for the same reason, you know, this bar over here represents the, the height of that represents the amount of data between 90 and 100. We don't know that the data actually gets to 100. 
So I'll probably put my bar a little bit short of 100 just to play it safe. So that's what the um, uh, box plot would look like for that histogram. Okay, so on this one, I'm going to start filling in the histogram until I think I got about a quarter of the data. So that much, about a quarter of the area under the whole thing. Um, that might be about it. That might be about it right there. So maybe my first quartile is right there. Now let's try to get the second quarter of the data. Come on, guy. Let me do it. Okay. Maybe right there. And then the third quarter of the data. Probably this much and maybe a little bit of that one. And then the remaining last 25% of the data is this stuff. See, it goes really far to the right and left because the bars aren't very high, so they don't account for much account for much area. So my box, hmm, my box looks like this, and the whiskers go off in this direction. Notice that the box plots are a little bit different, right? Um, this one is symmetric. The left-hand side looks the same as the right-hand side. This one's, a, this one's skewed. Notice it's shift, things are shifted off a little bit to the left. You know, this, this distance is shorter than that distance, right? So it's skewed. And we can see that in both the histogram and in the box plot, All right? So let's go look at another example here. I'm liking the bright colors on that one. I'll have to try to use that tool more often. Match each histogram with the corresponding box plot. All right, let me uh, move my annoying face out of here. Um, yeah, let's look at box plot, uh, sorry, histogram A. Which box plot would that be associated with? Now, I want to point out something. Look at box plot number one. No, notice they have these little X's. What are those? What do those represent? Those represent data values that people decided, whoever made the box plot decided to not include those in drawing the box plot. They decided to exclude those data points from the box plot itself. Why did they do that? Well, they decided that those are outliers, that those data are so, so far removed from the other data that they don't belong in the box plot. They somehow are too big to be included. Maybe we should just ignore them. That was how the, what they decided there. And there's a way to decide that. There's a mathematical way to identify outliers. Uh, I'm not going to require you to do that, but that's, uh, that's what they did. So those are data values. Those are data values. And so the maximum data value would, be, would correspond to the rightmost x there. Um, but um, but uh, they, they, they didn't include those in drawing the box plot. OK, anyway, uh, let's go back to A. Uh, which box plot would correspond to that histogram? Well, notice that um, this histogram is skewed again, and it's skewed where most of the data lies off to the right. So which box plot would I choose? I would choose the box plot where most data is off to the right, right? So that would be box plot three. And then B has the opposite going on. B has most data values sub shoved off to the left. Now, is it corresponding to number one or corresponding to number four? Now, that's a little trickier to see here. Um, what I do notice is that there's just a few data values out there between nine and 10. I think that corresponds to those outliers in picture number one. Moreover, um, we, we'll see when we get to part C that C really belongs to a different uh, box plot. So this one, is number one. That number four, we're going to attach it to something else here. So let's go to part C. C is also has all the data values off to the left, not all of them, but a lot of data values off to the left. So it's also going to be skewed to the left. 
So we can probably already see that it's going to be 4, but let's talk about why. Um, it looks like the first half of the data values, the first half is actually, the, these bars are so high, they probably account for the first half, so the median's probably at 2. And if you look at the box plot over there that has a median at 2, it's number 4. Right, so half the data uh, is, falls before we get to 2. And uh, the quarter, the, the, be, to the left of 2, the data is pretty much uniform. So I know that that much is 25%, and that's the other 25%. Now, to the right of this, um, if I split that part in half, I'd split it right here. So I know that my box would look like this, and my maximum value would go all the way out to there. So I would get a box plot that looks something like this. Let me do that one again. I think I see a better way to explain that. So when we move to part C here, um, here's, the, here's the quickest way to realize this one. First of all, where does it look like 50% of the data is? It looks like 50% of the data is right there. Those two bars are the same area as everything to the right. All right, so that means that the median would be right there. Q2 is right there. Now, remember where Q1 is. It's exactly halfway between... Um, it's exactly 50% of the data. Now, the data is uniformly distributed between 0 and 2, so the Q1 will be exactly halfway between 0 and 2. And now let's look to the right of 2. The data is roughly uniform to the right of 2. It's, everything's just kind of evenly distributed out there. So Q3 is going to be about halfway to the right, so right around there. So my box is going to look something like this. And then the max is somewhere over here, and the min is like that. So which, which, which one does that correspond to? It looks like number 4. And then part D, um, that one's symmetric. Which box plot is symmetric? It's number Two. Okay, so there we have it. Let's look at this guy over here. Here we have exam scores. The scores um, uh, on uh, the scores of honor students were compared to the scores of regular students on an aptitude test. And here we have box plots for those scores. And this is where box plots really shine. This is where they're really useful. Is when you compare two data sets side-by-side, side, when we do side-by-side side comparisons. Box plots are a really nice way to quickly see the difference between two distributions. So let's answer this first question. Which group had the highest scores? Well, remember, the rightmost extent of the box plot is the maximum value. And what are these box plots showing? They're showing scores. So the highest score is going to correspond to the rightmost uh, extent of the box plot. So for the regular students, the maximum was 76. Uh, for the honor students, the maximum was just short of 92. So which group had the highest scores? Honors. The honors group. Let me just adjust my laptop here. Okay. Which group had a larger average variation in scores? Well, remember, the average variation is given by, if you remember from our previous video, that's given by the IQR, the interquartile range. How do we measure the IQR? The IQR is the difference between Q3 and Q1, or in other words, the IQR is the width of the box. So which one had a wider box? Honors. Honors students scores were more varied than regular students scores. Part C. What were the median scores for regular versus honors students? Um, well, the median is that line in the middle of the box, right? So for regular students, the median is right there, and for honor students, it's right there. So for regular students, the median was, looks like it's 72, and for honor students, 
the median was, ah, uh, looks like it's not quite to 77. It looks like it's 76.5. That's what it looks like to me. If you scored 75, how do you compare to regular students? And how do you compare to honor students? If you score 75, then your score is right there. Okay, well, how do you compare to regular students? Well, look, the first one, two, three quartiles are all less than your score. How much data is less than the third quartile? 75% of the data, that's what the third quartile means. So if you scored 75, you did better than 75% than of regular students. All right, so um, better than 75% of regular students. Oop, am I, I think I'm in writing in, whoa, writing into my face here, okay. If you, how did you compare to honor students? Well, now let's look at your score. Um, it lines almost exactly up with the first quartile. So you did better, so the first quartile is better than exactly how much of the data? 25%. So to, be, to frame this in a positive sense, I would say you did better than 25% of honor students. But another way you could say it is that you did worse than 75% of honors students. You could say better than 25% or worse than 75%. They put you in the same place, right? And then finally, can you tell which group contained more students? And this is a question that very often trips beginning students up. They look at these and they say, well, which one has more? It must be the one that's bigger, or it must be the one that extends further to the right. But that's not right. Why isn't that right? Well, what are the box plots measuring? The box plots are not measuring the amount of students. The box plots are measuring exam scores. The further the box plot extends to the right, the larger the exam score was that was in that box plot. Um, you could have a box plot that extends very far to the right and have only two students in that group, right? You could just have two students and the maximum value is very large and so the box plot will extend very far to the right, but you have very few students in the group. So the extent that the box plot extends has nothing to do with the amount of data. It has to do with the data values. So can we tell which group contained more students? Absolutely not. You can't tell. You can't tell how many students were in the regular and how many students were in the honors group. Okay. So, um, next up, what do we have? Radish growth. So here we have um, different seedlings were planted, different radish seedlings were planted in different light uh, conditions. So some were planted in darkness, some diurnal, that's half dark, half light, uh, and then some in light conditions. And then they looked to see how much the radish shoots grew. And they made these plots. And so this is a scientific experiment where you can see the utility of box plots here. Um, we can compare these different groups very nicely side by side. Uh, which group contained the radish with the shortest, oh, sorry, the longest shoot growth? Well, growth is what's depicted on the y-axis. Right. So which one had the longest shoot growth? Right there is the longest shoot growth. Which group is that? That's the darkness group. So the radishes that were growing in darkness, these are just shoots, these are just baby radishes, actually grew the longest. The radishes in the darkness group are the ones that not all of them grew the longest, but the one that grew the longest was in the darkness group. Let's say it that way. Which group had the shortest 
radish shoot growth. Um, well, the shortest is down here. That's the light group. So apparently, uh, radish seedlings seem to not like uh, a lot of light. What, what percent of the darkness group was longer than 75% of the diurnal group? Okay. Longer than. So that means higher than. 75% of the diurnal group. So that means it has 75% of the diurnal group below it. Well, how do I get 75% of the diurnal group? Well, remember how the quartiles work. The first quartile is the first 25%. The second quartile is the second 25%. And the third quartile is the third 25%. So this much is 75%. So let's go over to the darkness group and how much of the darkness group was longer than that. How much of the darkness group is up here? Well, this is 25%. And this is 25%, so that means this is 50%, just the way quartiles work. So the answer is 50%. Part C, what percent of the light group was um, shorter than 75% of the diurnal group? Uh, what percent of the light group was shorter than 75% of the diurnal group. Shorter than means below. 75% uh, of the diurnal group. Okay, so this is 25%, this is 25%, and this is 25%, which means that this is 75% of the top shoot growths for the diurnal group. What percent of the light group was shorter than that? Well, look, this is 75, 75, and 75. Uh, sorry, 25, 25, 25. So this much is 75. 75%. Which group contained the most radishes? Part D. Well, this data, does it have anything to do with the number of radishes? No, it has nothing to do with it. These have to do with shoot growth lengths. Right? The number of radishes in, group, in each group, we have no idea what that is. There could be only four radishes in the darkness group, and there could be a hundred radishes in the light group. That could totally make these box plots. That's completely a possibility. Or it could be the other way around. We can't tell. So, oops, <laughs> the answer is not no. The answer is can't tell. Cannot tell what the information given. Do we have any more? Nope, that's it. So that's it for interpreting box plots. I hope you learned something, and I will see you in the next video.